Um, up next, I'm very pleased to welcome Kevin Ashley, a former colleague, uh, who we tried to get last year and it didn't work, but he's here this year here. and is going to talk to us about research data burden okay. or treasuresome chest. Great. Thanks very much, Frank. Give me the, give me the easy speakers to follow, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, and perhaps this is going to be a letdown for some of you in some ways. Uh, I'm thinking of the title of this event. I don't have a lot to say about technology. There's perhaps about a slide in there. I have even less to say about education. Uh, and, and I'm not too sure how much I have to say about the future, although taking a cue from Nicola early this morning, perhaps I'm going to be talking about the soon rather than, than the future. But it does leave me with two words, of and in, and I am going to be using them quite a lot <laughs> in the next 20 minutes. So, again, let's try and work out. Some of you are thinking, you know, I'm not interested in this research data. This is not what I do. I'm, I'm here about teaching. So let's think about who is, and let's think about perhaps why all of us should be interested in this. So looking at uh, HEDA data, this from a couple of years ago, so the figures may not be precise, but they, they tell pretty much the same story. Um, there are 164 universities in the UK, higher education institutions. Of those, about 43% get more than 5% of their income from research. So things that affect that type of income are of interest to them. 70% of them may not get the high percentage, but they're getting more than a million a year in research income. And that's still a figure large enough uh, to be of interest to them. But you can still say, but there's a whole bunch of higher education institutions there that aren't in any of those categories. And more than that, there are many of you who are not from higher education institutions, and this doesn't matter to you uh, at all. But let's look at it another way. 4.4 billion a year of public money in the UK is being spent uh, on this. I'd like to see that figure actually higher, but nonetheless, that's all of our money that's being spent uh, on research. All of us have an interest in ensuring that, that's, that, that we're getting the greatest possible effect out of that. And that's really what I want to talk about this afternoon. So those people who are getting some part, some slices of that 4.4 billion are getting a bit worried now. The funders are beginning to make these unreasonable demands about the money. It's not just about putting in a case uh, and then being given the money and going off and publishing some interesting papers and perhaps visiting interesting parts of the world uh, and going to conferences. You've, you've got to start doing stuff uh, with, your, with your outputs. This is uh, the Royal, um, sorry, Research Council's UK uh, common statement on this. Uh, lots and lots of, of different demands and words that, that are coming out of this, but a lot of them are about talking in advance about what you're going to do with the data that comes out of your research uh, and making it available to, for others to reuse when the research uh, is over. Some of those funders are making the demands on individual researchers, and some of them, like EPSRC, are making demands on the institution. They're saying that, actually, by 2012, they should all have had a roadmap about how they're going to comply uh, with the requirements of the funders. And by 2015, they need to be implementing that roadmap. And if they're not, they run the risk of their slice of that 4.4 billion going away. Now amongst, I'm not going to go into detail on their requirements, is that amongst them are things like this, an awareness of the regulatory environment, okay, we can deal with some of these relatively straightforwardly, making a statement about something, okay, that's not going to take up too much time. But some of the ones down the bottom there, uh, providing permanent identifiers for the data that comes out of research, and in particularly securely preserving data that comes out of research for 10 years after it was last used. So that's at least 10 years after the research finishes, potentially far longer if the research uh, gets reused uh, again. And again, that's exercising quite a lot of people involved with IT infrastructure in universities. They're worried, you know, how much is this going to cost us? So one of the things they're doing is trying to work out how much of this data do we have anyway? That turns out to be a rather difficult question for many people to answer. I asked that question at uh, an event I was at uh, in, in Northern Europe a while back whole bunch of people from different research intensive universities in general. How many of you think you know how much data there is uh, in your university? Not one of them has a clue about that. Um, some of us in the UK do. Um, Edinburgh at the moment is putting in provision for around five petabytes of storage. We don't know that that's the right amount, but we're hoping it's going to be. Oxford are guessing there's about three petabytes a year that they're going to have to store. And by, and by Comparison, there are some other figures there. 
the Large Hadron Collider, what we usually think of as that huge scale stuff, 15 petabytes a year. So we're up, not quite where they are, but in a similar sort of scale, not quite at what NSA and GCHQ are dealing with, with the 30 petabytes a month, but you know, it's still, it's a comparable sort of stuff. Two million investments in storage is not an unusual thing for universities to be doing. So this at the moment all sounds like it's the problem. Uh, it's the burden. And the problem is only going to get worse. Um, Martin just referred uh, in, in, in passing there to, to Moore's Law, something that many of us will be familiar with that tells us how much computing technology, how, how it's getting faster, doubling effectively around every uh, 18 months. Unfortunately, our ability to produce data is increasing far, far more rapidly. Uh, it's outstripping our ability to use technology to deal with it. And in fact, some projections show that uh, if you were to attempt to, to store all the data that we're capable of producing with various different types of technology at the moment, in about 20 years' time, the entire gross world product would simply be spent on buying disk drives or whatever it is that we're going to be using then to stick all of this data onto, never mind processing any of it. So there's a big problem, what some people refer to as the data deluge, the data tsunami, words like this have been used to describe it. So if you're a university worried about this, you might think, well, actually, no, no, there's an answer to this. It's, we don't have to store this. There's all these research data centers out there. Here's a few examples, and they deal with social science data and archaeological stuff and atmospheric data and oceanographic data. Um, in, in my own organization, the Digital Curation Center, we spent some time trying to produce a list of these. We got to about 650, uh, and we knew we still hadn't finished. And by that time, a list on its own is not enough. You need something to help you make sense of it. So perhaps they're the answer, perhaps they're the people who have to deal with this deluge and tsunami. But there's a problem. There are, although there are lots and lots and lots of these research data centers out there, they focus on particular disciplines, and lots and lots of disciplines have no data center to deal with their stuff. And it's not really anybody's job to make one come into to existence. So at the moment, universities still have to deal with a lot of this material. We're still faced um, with, uh, with dealing with that problem. So, okay. Um, if the data centers aren't the answer, we're hearing a lot about cloud and how it provides you know, benefits uh, for storage. And, and, and indeed, cloud can help us solve a lot of different technology problems in universities. But if we're talking about the long-term storage of information, it is not the answer. And I can't go into this in detail now, but David Rosenthal has done an analysis of this. He's published a paper about it. Uh, and when you can get copies of the slides after, you can follow up these references. Now, I'm just going to pull out a couple of graphs he did to try and demonstrate this. So he's doing a comparison uh, between the cost, in this case, of storing data for 100 years, between assuming that you're doing it locally and assuming you're doing it with Amazon S3 and making some reasonable assumptions about how Amazon's prices will change over time and how the cost of your local storage will change over time. That's the size of the difference. It's huge. It's more than double. Now, it, it varies a bit. This thing down the bottom is something called Crider's Law. We can't, it's something similar to Moore's Law, in it, and it predicts the rate at which, you know, a constant amount of money, how much storage that will buy uh, in, in a few years' time. And what he's showing there, it doesn't really matter whether we got that estimate right or wrong. The gap is still there. Okay, you'll say Amazon S3, that's not designed for long-term storage. They've got a special service called Amazon Glacier for that. So we did the analysis again with Glacier. So the green line there now is still S3. Glacier is, is, is the blue line down at the bottom. There is still a difference. It's not as big, but it's 20%, and it pretty much stays 20% no matter where you play with the numbers. It's not going to be cheaper to use cloud to store things for the long term. So yeah, we've got a problem here one way or, or another. But it's not as simple as that. The funders don't make these requirements just because they like making life difficult. They're, they're doing it for a reason. They believe there's value in this data that they're asking us uh, to, to keep. They believe the value is there not only to them as funders, it's there to society from the reuse, and that there's also value for the institution hanging on to this. In, in, in short, everybody should benefit uh, if we do this. So let's try and understand why that, be, why that might be. And, and they're not the only people to accept this. So um, my own organization is amongst those who's benefited from investment uh, from, from biz, the people who are behind uh, our funding councils. Relatively small investment in, in nurturing the development of research data services, 1.5 million, and, and an argument using treasury rules that that's going to pay back 2.5 times the investment after only uh, a few years. They're happy 
that that's going to come out. So why, what sort of benefits might our own organizations get from this? Well, some of you may be aware uh, of this uh, journal, the Journal of Irreproducible Results, and it's a very entertaining read, and I'd recommend it if you're interested in science and want a bit of humor. But it's not the sort of journal most people ought to want to publish in. Research is usually about reproducibility. It's about describing something that other people can do uh, and learn from. And if people can't reproduce what you do, there's an argument that perhaps it wasn't really uh, research at all. And indeed, institutions are certainly worried about their integrity. And there's a strong argument that almost every case of scientific fraud we can demonstrate is tied up in some way to the unavailability of the data that was behind that research. And when the data is not available, it's very difficult to prove that people were being fraudulent. What's more, when you go the other way, when your research is reproducible because information and methods are available, it gets cited. People and institutions in general like the idea that, um, that our stuff is cited. And, and you, know, you could argue, for instance, that the, uh, probably one of the highest forms of citation you can get in some forms of, uh, of science is to be awarded the Nobel Prize. Some of you might uh, be aware the chap called uh, Peter Higgs was uh, jointly awarded that earlier this week uh, for his work on the, the, the Higgs boson uh, many, many uh, years ago. Now, Peter's an emeritus professor at the University of Edinburgh, where I'm based. He hasn't actually been working there uh, for 20 years, but I can tell you it was a very small number of microseconds between the announcement uh, of that Nobel Prize and the University of Edinburgh homepage changing to point out the connection that we still had in some way uh, with Peter Higgs. They like the idea that work uh, from the university is cited. Well, it turns out that making your data available, as well as just publishing results, greatly increases the citation to your work, and, and everybody benefits from this, the academic, the funder, and the institutions. If you want evidence of this, there's at least three studies I've mentioned looking at the connection between open data being available and the citation rate of the data behind it. Now, it varies, but there's a positive effect from 9% right up to 240% in the social sciences in very, very different disciplines there. Astronomy, social science, microarray data, highly specialized area of, of, of the, the life sciences. But it tends to show that this effect always exists, even if it varies uh, in, in type. And there's also value just within the institution. Never mind this stuff about citations that, that, that academics like. A good, a well-curated set of data ends up behaving a bit like a lab uh, inside your own institution. It, 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 it's, it makes it a, a good place to do research. You can build new research uh, on, on the old. And also, using real data from real research in the context of teaching, and teaching future re researchers in particular, makes a big difference to the value of that teaching rather than using sort of made-up material. And there's other strong evidence that there's value to be had from keeping data in the right sort of places uh, and, and of making it available for, for, for others to, to, to reuse. Some of you, perhaps, uh, for instance, uh, have either found out you're successful or were disappointed if you tried to put money uh, into the uh, ill-advised privatization of the post office that's been occurring this week. Well, if you failed in that, I can tell you uh, there's something else that potentially is going to give you an even greater return, something between 400% and 1,200% returns, absolutely guaranteed. And if you want to know where that is, you need to be putting your money into the British Atmospheric Data Center, not the obvious place, perhaps, for hedge funds uh, and others to be, to be looking at. A recent study shows that every pound invested in that brings us back four to 12 pounds of, of value. Now, of course, the problem with this is this is not quite the same as investing in a company. It's not you who gets your money back because BADC makes huge amounts of profit out of the information about the atmosphere it gets there. It, it's, it's society as a whole that's benefiting to that amount because that data can be reused, because we can observe something once and learn many, many different things from that one set of observations if they can be made available to people. And if you're still worried uh, as a particular university that perhaps this is, this is all very well and you can see that you ought to be trying to take care of this, but you're still worried that your own infrastructure isn't up to, to doing it. There are beginning to be commercial partners uh, that are becoming available to do it. Archivum and Figshare uh, are two that I'll mention. Interestingly, Figshare is behaving perhaps quite differently from some of the other commercial partners. They are originally not targeting their services at universities, at the IT directors, the librarians, or anywhere else. They're targeting the researchers directly. They're bypassing 
the intermediary and simply saying, you want to get impact from your stuff, give it to us. We'll let other people get at it. We'll give you a means to make it citable and tie it to your publications. And they're being very, very successful uh, in that particular business model. But of course, even though that data is kept, you need to be able to find it. Another thing that Martin mentioned in his previous presentation was the work of Jack Andraka, the 14-year-old the uh, who, as he put it, used Google to cure cancer. So it's not entirely untrue that he did that, but what he really did was use Google to find some data that he could then use to make some deductions that could then cure cancer. So the key thing for him there was that the data he wanted to get at was discoverable using the search engines he knew how to use. He didn't have to go to a specialist data center, the British Atmospheric Data Center, or any of those others that I mentioned to find his stuff. He could find it. The stuff was exposed to the world using whatever search terms you, you, you wanted to use. So it, it has to be discoverable uh, in those ways, either on its own or tied to a publication where you read something, this is interesting, I'd like to see the information that, that, that's behind it. And that's something that institutions can do something to make that happen, but you also need something at national and international scale to try and really make that work. And that's something that, that just at the moment is piloting uh, through my own organization, the Digital Curation Center, to try and help institutions do that. One of the reasons why you need those discovery services to, to work in, in, in really joined up ways is that occasionally you can do something interesting by combining two different sets of data. And at that scale, it, it is quite acceptable that you do something quite manual, even if you all end up, all you end up with is two different spreadsheets and you download them and you put them together and, and you knit them together in some way, that, that manual process is fine. But frequently now we realize that lots of interesting research depends on combining hundreds, if not thousands, of different data sources. That's not something where the manual stitching together, even the manual process of discovery, uh, is, is, is really gonna, gonna help you. You need far more automated systems that, that will allow you to blend together these sources with a minimal amount of effort uh, to get in the way of the, the, the research you, you, you want to do. And that's, we don't have that yet in many areas, but some people are beginning to build infrastructures in particular disciplines to make that happen. You may hear of certainly European-wide projects like Elixir in the Alliance Sciences, uh, Daria, which is trying to do something similar in the arts and humanities, so you may not realize, but do have research data. So, there's advice available to institutions to try and help you uh, with this problem, advice of different sorts, services, training, consultancy, and everything else. But I'm not going to spend time talking about that. If you don't want that advice, another way to solve the problem is through collaboration, a message we've heard a lot about today. Here are three examples of cases where universities have got together to say, this problem's a bit too big for us to solve on our own, but together we can do something. We can split the infrastructure, the advice, the other parts of the things that we need to make this work. 3TU uh, in the Netherlands, uh, the, uh, the White Rose Group uh, in, in, in the UK, and there's also shareable training being produced, uh, such as that by my colleagues in the University of Edinburgh, Mantra, there. Because the sort of thing that we're really trying to make happen is to ensure not simply that you get that sort of typical life cycle where one researcher has an idea and does something, and then that idea spawn, you know, sparks something else, and you get, and you get this little circle of work that tends to go around with the individual, but that you can begin to join up what one set of person does and some of their ideas or some of their outputs can be picked up and reused by others and we really magnify the effect of all that research going on. Again, we achieve collaboration even when we don't collaborate together on the same thing, I can pick up bits of what you do and use it to do a bit of what I do. And also by making data available even when our research didn't quite turn out the way we planned, perhaps we didn't get the publication out of it, we wanted to, but we collected some interesting data on the way. It means that those virtual circles still work, even when some other parts of them are broken. But getting people to publish that negative data as well as the positive is a difficult thing to do. But I'll describe some of the reasons, just a few of the stories that, that, that suggest why reusing data beyond the disciplines it was created in and just within them is, is a useful thing. Uh, things like the paleontologist, somebody who's working on things to do with dinosaurs and others from 60, from 100 million years ago, who managed to disprove another theory using data collected by archaeologists who are really focusing only on the past 10, 20, 30,000 years, not disciplines typically that interact with each other very much, but a serendipitous discovery of data that enable that to work. The fact that uh, 
an enterprising researcher, in fact, in the Netherlands, realized that what their weather radar was throwing away uh, as noise in a, in a bit of research that they were doing uh, about ice formation uh, in clouds was actually the key bit of information they needed to track the dust from that volcano in Iceland that caused all those problems three and a half years ago. It was the first really accurate map we had of where the dust was. But to their original research, that wasn't information. It was noise to be thrown away. We managed to get it just in time before, before we lost it. And those, who's in this room has heard of something called old weather? Org, one of those crowdsourcing online things that grew out of Galaxy 2. Well, if, if you haven't heard about it, go out and find out about it. This is a really useful example of how information from 19th century ship's logs, which has now been digitized, is now being used to help us understand and improve our models of climate change. A really great example. And so all of these illustrate the fact that sometimes our data tell stories that we didn't even understand were there, that our own publications don't tell, tell us about, about the data itself. And it's why it's important that the data and the publications are both available, but both available separately. So I'll leave uh, with uh, a metaphor from my colleagues at one of those collaborations, uh, the 3TU, three technical universities uh, in the Netherlands, who when they launched their collaborative um, research data service, presented uh, all of their researchers, one of these uh, treasure chests, with a message inside that they wanted all of them to take away, to share their data, uh, to show it to the world, and to get credit for themselves and greater benefit for society out of it. Well, I'll finish at that point. Thanks very much, and I think we're on to questions now. Thank you very much, Kevin.